Kia ora Thank you, Marty. It's good to be back in the far north. I want to start with profound congratulations to the councils of Northland and Auckland for having the courage to do what their citizens want, for having the courage to stand up against the bullies, and for having the intelligence to work in collaboration together. We have this incredible record. Now, yes, there have been field trials, but field trials are small, most of them not bigger than this room. They are theoretically contained, although the containment has been found to be wanting in a number of cases. They are all pulled up and destroyed at the end of the trial. So a field trial is a very, very different thing from a commercial release. Once a commercial release is done, you can never call it back. You can never undo what you've done. We do have some GE ingredients in food, but only those that have been processed to the point where if they got out of the, the can or the packet, they couldn't grow into another plant, so they can't spread. And there are rules about labelling them, and they're not sufficient rules, and most of all, they're not sufficiently enforced. But if you know what to look for, it's possible to pretty much avoid GE ingredients in your food, if you're careful and if you really want to. Whereas once they're grown in the environment, there's nothing you can do to avoid it. We almost had our first release of genetically engineered crop in 1999. Now, does that seem a long time ago? In 1999, Monsanto was in the process of applying to Irma, as it was then, for consent for a broad-scale release of GE canola all over the South Island. In fact, I was at the airport and I ran into the chair of Irma and said, oh, um, have, you, have you notified Monsanto's application yet? And he said, oh, oh no, has Monsanto's application come in yet? Oh, yeah, he says, I said, well, that's funny, nothing's been notified, I've been watching for it. Oh, well, he says, I've been in Australia for three days, but when I left, they were on the point of lodging it. Well, they haven't lodged it, and they never did. Because, well, I, my theory is they got lent on, look, there was an election coming up in about four months and um, it'd be kind of convenient if you just hold off till next year before you put this in, said certain people. Um, plus there was a big public movement already by 1999. Um, I had a petition underway asking for two things, a Royal Commission of Inquiry so we could get all the evidence on the table and a moratorium on any release until it reported. We got 93,000 signatures on that petition, making it one of the larger ones New Zealand's ever had. And I think they decided that discretion might be the better part of valour. Well, by the time the um, election was over, um, we had a moratorium, and that went on for four years. And while we weren't that happy with the outcome of the Royal Commission, and we were very angry that the moratorium got lifted, when a lot of the recommendations of the Royal Commission had never been implemented, we had managed to raise the bar in the legislation high enough that the companies weren't too keen on trying to jump it. We had demonstrated that there was huge public opposition to this technology, and we'd had four years of delay, and that was time for information from overseas about um, uh, herbicide resistant weeds and stacking and so forth to filter through the new system. So I think that four years delay was crucial and somehow we have kept our GE free status. Some people have always wanted to change that. We know who they are. I won't say we know where they live, but <laughs> we know who they are. <laughs> and they believe that genetic engineering technologies offer huge opportunities for economic prosperity and all sorts of other um, <coughs> things classed with motherhood and apple pie for this country. So I want to start by just looking at what are the claimed advantages? Why do they think this is such a great idea? Well, the first thing they always say is with 7 billion people going on 9 billion, we can't feed the world without it. So G is going to feed the world, right? Well, what would you need to feed the world? that you can't do now. I mean, I suppose 
you'd be producing more food per acre with a GE crop than you would be with a normal crop, right? Otherwise, you're not going to feed the world, are you? Well, if you look at the statistics, there is no evidence, apart from some evidence for cotton, which doesn't feed the world anyway, yields are about the same, a little bit up in some places, down in other places, but on average, yields are no higher across all the crops than they are with conventional seed. So that one falls flat on its face. If you've got to pay every time for a new batch of seed and you can't save your own, that's going to raise the costs of food production. If you've got to pay royalties to Monsanto and Syngenta whenever, whenever you plant a crop, that's going to raise the cost of food production. And there are multiple interlocking patents for every new GE product that is produced. There are a host of, of patents required and that raises the costs as well. Now, a few years ago, a group called EASTED <laughs> took, undertook a huge inquiry. It was a host of scientists working for four years on how could we feed a growing population um, in a sustainable way. And they came to the conclusion that GE wasn't it. They came up with so much evidence about how conventional crops with clever selective breeding and what they called agroecology, which is pretty much organic techniques, was doing better in yields, better in resilience against climate change and drought, better in every way than the GE crops. Now, that's a daunting report to get hold of and read, but if you're interested, um, there's this little book that Jack Heinemann, a scientist in Christchurch, wrote called Hype, Hope Not Hype. Um, which kind of, he was one of the authors, one of the many that contributed to that report, and he summarised its findings here, and it's a fascinating read if you are interested in that. The second claim they make, and another reason why we're going to feed the world with this technology, is that we're going to be able to control pests and weeds so much better with genetic engineering. Well, it turns out that the vast majority of all the GE crops out there being grown in other countries now are genetically engineered for one trait only, and that is resistance to Monsanto's Roundup herbicide. Um, so why would that help? Well, it means that you can control the weeds by spraying the whole crop repeatedly with Roundup and then harvesting it. So when you eat that stuff, you are getting a huge dose of herbicide. There's a kind of perception in New Zealand that Roundup is relatively safe. That is, that is, a, that is I don't know how they managed to get that kind of PR around what is quite a nasty herbicide. So if you, read, if you eat uh, Roundup ready, as they call them, crops, you are eating a lot of Roundup in the process. But it gets worse than that. Because after a while, they get resistant to Roundup. And then they've got to start using more and more toxic herbicides, things like um, 2,4-D, for example, um, which are even worse than Roundup. Then there's the control of insect pests, with um, the, the second most common um, engineered kind of plant, which is Bt. Bt bacillus thuringiensis is a, a little um, bacterium which infects and kills a lot of um, insect pests on crops. It's used by organic farmers as a natural spray, just using the natural stuff. But what this modification does is engineer the plant so it produces Bt throughout the plant so that the plant is poisonous all the time to these insects. Well, we don't know what that does to people in eating it, and um, there hasn't been much attempt to find out. Um, but it also means that the insects can then become resistant to Bt in a way that they don't when you just spray it once or twice a year, 
But if it's there all the time, they become resistant. And then you've got to use um, stronger pesticides. But also, if you do succeed in killing the pest you're trying to kill, then other ecological niches open up and other pests come in, and you've got to use other pesticides to get rid of them. So that doesn't seem to have worked particularly well either. Okay, once you get past Roundup Ready and BT crops, everything else is a promise. Nothing else actually exists commercially. So what do they promise? They promise more resistance to drought. Plants that can tolerate water stress. Well, with what's coming with climate change, that would be a damn good idea because where they have a lot of water stress plants and shortages of water are going to be a serious problem with climate change and that is going to affect agricultural yields. So I had a bit of a look, of a look into that one. There have been in the past something like a thousand applications for uh, permits in the United States for trials of GE varieties that would be drought resistant. Not a single one of those thousand has ever come to market. So it does seem that that is not working either. However, during the same time, when all these resources have gone into a thousand different ways of engineering a plant to make it tolerate drought, there's been a 20% improvement in water stress of plants in Africa under a program of ordinary selective breeding. Mm -hmm. Then there's the promise that we can breed plants which will have higher nutritional value. Now, agribusiness has never been all that interested in nutritional value of its crops, actually. Um, it's producing mass commodities. It's not really in the business of, um, of um, nurturing people. It's in the business of producing mass commodities. But anyway, they got together and they produced this stuff that was meant to be the flagship for a caring sharing, loving GE industry, and it was called Golden Rice. And Golden Rice was engineered to have uh, vitamin A in it, which rice doesn't naturally have. It was engineered with the daffodil gene, I think, to make it yellow, you see, to have the, the golden vitamin A in it. And this was to help those poor kids in um, desperately poor nations who get to eat nothing but rice and who are seriously vitamin A deficient and therefore go blind. Now, there's a humanitarian project for you. Wouldn't that be a nice thing to support? Well, one of the scientists that we brought to the Royal Commission investigating this stuff gave evidence that the amount of golden rice you would have to eat to get enough vitamin <coughs> A to be any protection at all against blindness was absolutely enormous. Like it was. I wish I could remember the number now, but this is going back in two kilos, two kilos per person. Two kilos per person per day. Yeah. Two kilos of dry rice, right? Yeah, Before yeah. it's cooked. Two kilo okay, I had thought maybe it was four, but that sounded like a lot. Two kilos per person per day of dry rice um, in order to get enough protein. Well, why not organise for those people to have some green leafy vegetables in their diet instead? Which is where you need to get your, your vitamin A from. <laughs> yeah. And then there's the possibility of engineering plants or animals for medicinal uses. Um, plants that produce um, medical substances, pharmaceuticals, that can then be extracted and given to people. Well, if you actually want to make a pharmaceutical in a plant by engineering it, and if it turns out you can do that and you can do that safely, you can grow those indoors, and you can do the extraction indoors, and then you've got a pharmaceutical, which because it's a pharmaceutical, will have to be tested through phase one, two, and three trials before it's allowed to be released. You don't have to test, it just, it just goes out there. With a pharmaceutical, you can at least assume that it's been through some testing process. So that, that wouldn't be ruled out by having an embargo on, on growing them. And there's the awful process, of course, that cows are going through at Ruakura, where they're engineering the cows to express human proteins in their milk, from which they hope to extract a cure for multiple sclerosis. Now, I had a friend who died recently of multiple sclerosis, and it's a horrible thing. 
And if I could see a reasonable way of helping people like that, I'd be pretty open to doing it. But the thing is, you can get the product they're trying to make other ways from natural, um, natural sources. It's just you can't get enough of it. Wouldn't you think the logical thing would be to test that substance and see whether it does anything for multiple sclerosis before you try to engineer cows to make more of it? They've never done that. They've never shown that the substance they're trying to make is any use at all for that illness. What this is, is a technology looking for a use. It's an answer looking for a question. So in summary, there has been no advantage to consumers, to ecology, or to the public interest from any GE crop that has been commercialised ever. The money that's made from genetic engineering is not made by the growers, it's made by the holders of the IP. It's made by the Monsantos and the Syngentas and the Dales and so forth. And that IP is controlled by five transnational companies. So you would think that if there is no evidence of any real benefit, why do you need proof of harm to say no to it? People could say, well, you can't prove that anybody's ever got sick from eating GE food. Well, of course you can't. It's impossible to do the experiment. How would you ever do it? How would you ever show that a, a person's illness was due to them eating a GE <coughs> food when they eat all sorts of other things as well? And you can't actually control what people... With animals, you can have some kind of control and feed them only on GE maize and nothing else until they get sick and, and then look. And you can't do that with humans. So that there is no possible experiment that's going to give you the answers you want with humans. So we don't have proof that anybody's health has been harmed by eating GE food. We do have quite a bit of evidence, but that's not the same as proof. Let's be really clear about that. So the first harm that people are worried about is effects on their health. And of course there have never been any proper long-term studies of the effects on humans. There have been a few studies on animals, remarkably few, and the ones done by the industry all found no effect. And the ones done independently all found some worrying effects. But it was not proof of harm because it would need to be replicated. And I mean, when you start looking into what it takes to do these, to do these tests, even getting a substance that is guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be the pure genetically engineered um, plant in the first place is impossible because the people who make it won't give it to you if you're a university wanting to do tests. You know, it's extraordinarily difficult. But there is a strong suspicion of health impacts. Um, you know, animals, um, animal feeding studies have shown um, the animals have ended up with problems in their gut, to put it very kind of generally and, and, and crudely. I can give you all the details, but you probably don't want them. <laughs> um, there's no proof that that, is always, that that happened because of the food or that it's always going to happen because of the food. But there's quite a strong suspicion. Why would this be? Well, at the heart of the matter is that when you take a gene from one organism, and you insert it into another organism by a random and quite violent means, like a gene gun, mm. you can't control where it ends up in the genome. You can't control what gene it's next to. You can't control how many copies of it go in. And it's not like, it's not like Lego. You take a bit of blue Lego and a bit of yellow Lego and you clip them together and all you've ever got is a bit of blue Lego clipped to a bit of yellow Lego. But the, the DNA doesn't work like that. The, the blue Lego is going to affect the way the, blue, the yellow Lego operates and all the other genes in there as well. And so it's these completely unpredictable effects mm. plus the other things they put in in addition to the gene, which are quite a few like um, marker materials. Now the film you're going to see says 
there have been a marked increase in certain kinds of illness since 1996, which is when GE Foods first came on the market. We've got to be careful about that kind of statement. It could be that people are getting sick now because of the foods they've been eating since 1996. But it could be for a host of other reasons too. Like there's been an increase in obesity, there's been a, um, perhaps people getting less exercise, there's been all kinds of all kinds of things that happened. So you can't say that's that's um, you can't say that's proof, but you can say it's worrying evidence. The second kind of harm, and one that I think you'll be quite concerned with up here, is that people growing non-GE crops are likely to have their crops contaminated with GE plants and that then their markets won't accept them. And that is a very real economic risk for New Zealand. Right or wrong, a lot of our markets are quite high-end discriminating markets and they do not want GE foods and if they think that that's what they're going to get, they'll stop buying our stuff. Now, the Royal Commission took this very seriously. They made eight recommendations for things that needed to be done to make it possible to grow GE crops here, non-GE crops here, without any mixing or cross-contamination. Only one of those eight recommendations was ever implemented. That was the main bunch of Royal Commission recommendations that the government just ignored. They said that's too hard. I'm sure if the Royal Commission sat now, they wouldn't make those eight recommendations. They would just say it can't be done. I tried for three years to get an implementation of the post-election promise that uh, the government made to us in 2005. And um, it was a nightmare. But they kept changing the minister responsible, so I just get him kind of to start to understand what the issue was and what I was trying to get. And then all of a sudden I'd be dealing with somebody else. And in the end it was Trevor Mallard who ended up in the portfolio, and he wouldn't have been my first pick for somebody who would be sympathetic, but he said, well, if we made a deal, then, you know, we've got to implement it. But then the officials got in the way, and boy, they weren't going to let this happen at all. Eventually, all I got was a requirement written as a regulation for the applicant to, who wanted to release a GE crop to state the mechanism, the measures they were going to take to avoid cross-contamination across boundaries, mm -hmm. which sounds very little, but actually if you'd been in a hearing situation, you could have done a lot with what they would or wouldn't have said in response to that. Well, we know that the monitoring of the field tests is derisory, and we know that the enforcement of the rules has been pretty poor as well. Now, the third harm you might possibly be worried about is ecological harm <coughs> from growing these, these organisms. What is the effect on soil microorganisms of a massive increase in the use of Roundup? Mm -hmm. Which, incidentally, I only learned recently, started life as an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. As an anti... But, yeah. It was designed originally to kill microorganisms. So um, you've got to ask, well, what happens to soil when you do that? And I know there's a scientist down at Massey who's very concerned about that issue. We do know that in the laboratory, monarch butterflies are harmed, very, are killed by Bt. We don't know a lot about what happens out in the field. We do know that there are less monarchs around than there used to be. Um, to, but then that's true here, and we don't have Bt um, GE crops here, but that's certainly true in the US. So we just don't know. I mean, there just hasn't been any effort to study what happens ecologically when you grow these things. But the fourth one, the fourth harm, is not a possible or a potential harm, it's an actual harm. And it's what's going on right now, and it's what I really want to emphasise tonight. And that is a loss of democracy and a loss of local control over our own futures. Central government announced that they were going to amend the RMA to make it impossible for councils to have any control whatever over GMOs. This is all to be done at central government. 
level. Never mind that the purpose of the RMA is to allow some local democracy and to allow some things to be controlled locally because what's right for here is not necessarily right for Southland. And we've seen a big increase in the last few years, I believe, in central government trampling over the top of local government and restricting what it's allowed to do. Local government power was stripped right back in the um, amendment to the Act, which got rid of the four well-beings, which was a basis for doing things that were good for the community. They sacked um, ECAM in Christchurch, the elected regional council was all dismissed by central government and commissioners put in and then they didn't even let them have another election at the following election. The commissions are still there, still running the show. Why did they do that? Well they had a whole lot of supposed reasons but actually it was because the council got really serious about protecting the quantity and the quality of Canterbury's water and they stopped handing out irrigation permits uh, willy-nilly to anybody that wanted them and they started restricting access to water because the water isn't there. Mm -hmm. Well, that meant they were got rid of. The powers in the earthquake legislation are absolutely draconian in overruling whatever elected local representatives want. The powers in the Rugby World Cup legislation were absolutely draconian in overruling all other forms of decision making. And they're threatening, as I said, under the RMA to override what your councils want to do as well. So this is not going to be an easy ride. Just because we've got these excellent proposed clauses in the proposed plans, it's a huge step to have come this far, but it's only a first step because it is going to be fought bitterly by all the people who want you to have GE, whether you like it or not. And the only tool we've got against that kind of power is mass demonstration of people. And five submissions on the proposed district plan are not going to do it, and neither is 25. Northland has a right to decide for itself what it wants to grow, surely? Who can tell us that the rights of Syngenta and Monsanto are greater than the rights of Northland farmers? I mean, I find that totally outrageous. It's up to Northland whether it wants to risk the loss of markets and the contamination of food. And the next one, the one they're, the one they're really keen to do, of course, is grass seed. Um, genetically engineered ryegrass. Well, you know how grass seed spreads. I mean, that would be completely uncontainable. Even in a field trial, it would be totally uncontainable. But Monsanto and Syngenta only have the rights here that we choose to give them. And if we allow the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, to go ahead, that will make it a great deal worse, because then, if a, a council um, passes a rule about GMOs, or even if we get a government in the future that decides not to have them, they'll get sued by Monsanto and Syngenta. And our kids as taxpayers will have to bear the cost of that, and it won't be in a New Zealand court, it'll be at some international tribunal which is secret and unelected. So this is about a long-term resistance. And resistance, in this case, has to start with thousands of submissions. Mm. So if there's anybody in this room that was thinking, there'll be enough other people, I probably don't have to do one, think again. It will be worth my trip up if everybody walks out of this room today determined that they are not only going to do a personal submission, but they're going to get everybody else that they know to do submissions as well because what we have got that they haven't got is numbers. <coughs> Personally, I've just about given up writing submissions. I've seen what happens to them at the other end. I've seen how often they get ignored, they get ridiculed and, and they don't lead to any change. So I've pretty much stopped doing them. But 
This time, we have to do it, even if they aren't going to listen. Because getting thousands of submissions in creates legitimacy for whatever else we have to do afterwards. If we get thousands of submissions in and they don't listen, then there is a legitimacy for a huge march in the streets. Some of you all remember the 20,000 people that marched in Auckland on GE yeah. back in, when was that, was that around about 2002 yeah. or so? It was a fantastic turnout. We had two of them actually mm -hmm. with similar numbers and they just went on and on forever, the whole Queen Street full of people. That's, that made government stop and think. Not much less than that is going to. Make it an election issue. Bail up national and Labour candidates and ask them. Um, my experience is that they're both equally bad on this issue. Uh, not on every issue, but on this issue. There's not really much to choose between them. Um, I remember being in a meeting with Helen Clark, and it's probably long enough afterwards now that I can talk about it. Uh, we had some big arguments about this, and she said, well, if the councils choose to put it in their plan, I can tell you, we will not take the councils to the Environment Court. And I said, no, you'll just wait for Monsanto to do it for you. And she said, yes, that's right. Getting this far is a huge success. It's an enormous tribute to the people who have worked so hard for so long. Don't let them down. And it's actually better if you don't just send in a form submission saying, I support the change. I guess that's better than nothing. It doesn't have a lot of weight. I've sat on a lot of committees receiving a lot of submissions. The ones that count are the ones that give reasons. And the ones that count most are the ones that give personal experience, you know. I'm opposed to GMOs because I'm a grower and I know that my fruit goes to markets that are very discriminating and I think we're going to lose our economic base here in Northland. I'm a person whose children have a lot of allergies and I'm concerned about the effect that GE pollen or um, GE food being widespread in the community might have on their health. Whatever, whatever your personal story is, if you've got a personal reason to oppose them, put that in, that actually has weight. But if there isn't a personal reason, then just go through the arguments. They, none of these crops has ever been shown to produce any good for the consumer or for society at large. The risks are there, even though they're not proven. We don't want it, we don't need it. Turn their own arguments on their heads. Feeding the world. Joke. Reducing pesticide use. Right. Talk about the mass use of Roundup that is caused by Roundup Ready crops. And use your own words because that makes all the difference. So, good luck. Okay.